Good evening. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to send back amazing pictures. And recently, it's been studying planetary nebulae. A planetary nebula isn't really a nebula. It's a star coming to the end of its active life, becoming unstable, and throwing off jets of material. Look at this one with a double jet. The inner star must be a close binary system. And look at this one, NGC 7009, with a very fast jet. And this one has a jet also, and a curious thing known as a flyer. And what about this one? Here we have a very unstable jet. Altogether, amazing things, a long way away, and of course, only Hubble can take pictures like that. But this evening, I want to come much nearer home and concentrate entirely upon our own solar system. And first of all, the lunar prospector. We are going back to the moon. And prospector is now in lunar orbit, sending back data, and searching for lunar ice, though, frankly, I shall be very, very surprised if it finds any. Look into the southwestern sky after sunset, and there you will see the planet Saturn, shining like a rather bright star. And you can't mistake it, it's quite conspicuous, and there's nothing equally bright anywhere near it. With binoculars, you will see there's something rather odd about its shape, and use the telescope and then you will see the lovely ring system, unlike anything else in the solar system. Oh yes, I know, Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune all have rings, but they are nothing like Saturn's. Saturn's rings are made up of swarms of icy particles, all spinning around Saturn like tiny moons. And of course, they are circular, but um, from here we see them foreshortened, and therefore they appear elliptical. So let's have a bird's eye view of Saturn's rings. The outer ones, E, F and G, you can't actually see with ordinary telescopes. And neither can you see the so-called ring D, which isn't really a ring at all. It's a cloud of particles going down almost to the top of Saturn's gas clouds. The main rings are C, B and A. Ring C, the crepe or dusky ring, is uh, just transparent. But the two main ones, A and B, they are the bright rings. And they're the rings you see so clearly with a telescope. In the outer ring, ring A, there's a narrow division then to the Enki division, and the two bright rings are separated by the well-known Cassini division. And in this lovely drawing by Paul Dirty, you'll see all those things. The Cassini division's there. You will also see the Enki division. Now, of course, from Earth, Saturn appears rather small. It's a long way away, nearly 900 million miles from the Sun. And that's shown here in this photograph by Commander Hatfield. Saturn just about to be occulted by the Moon you can see how small Saturn appears, smaller than a lunar crater. And therefore it's amazing how much detail we can actually see on it. And look at this view. There again we have a Voyager picture, the rings, the Cassini division, Enki division, cloud belts on Saturn, and the gas disk itself. But those rings are quite amazing. There's an image sent back by the Voyager probe, and there are thousands of narrow ringlets and minor divisions. And that, frankly, is something we simply did not expect. We thought it would be much less complicated than that. And it looked to me like a kind of a, a wave motion, and it may well be so. And if so, then, no doubt, the gravitational pulls of Saturn's satellites have a great deal to do with it. And Saturn has a whole family of moons. Before Voyager, nine were known, and I can see eight of those on my own modest 15-inch telescope of my own observatory. A little while ago, I had a rather good view. And there they are from left to right. Aepetus, Titan, Rhea, Tethys, Dione, Mimas, Enceladus, and Hyperion. The only one I can't see from there is Phoebe, the outer one. And I say, those names can be pronounced in various different ways, and pronunciation experts, please don't write to me about it. Now, these moons go around Saturn at different distances and in different periods. And their orbits are not the same. Here's a diagram, not to scale, I may say. We couldn't really make that diagram to scale because Mimas, the inner moon shown here, goes around Saturn at only 115,000 miles in just over 22 hours. And Phoebe is 8 million miles around and goes around in 550 days. So it's a very varied system. And as you can see from that picture, Titan's much the largest. So let's have a look now at the sizes of Saturn's satellites. Given here in kilometers, Titan is just over 3,000 miles in diameter, and that is larger than the planet Mercury, and of course, much larger than our own moon. That's the only big one. Then now let's put in the smaller ones. The medium-sized moons, Rhea, Aepetus, Dione, and Tethys, and then the much smaller Enceladus, Mimas, 
the hamburger-shaped Hyperion, and tiny Phoebe. So they are all very much smaller than our moon, apart from Titan, and Titan is the real giant, easily visible with a small telescope, shown there in that photograph, over to the left of Saturn, just below center. And I made a sketch the other night, and again, showed it to the left of Saturn. You can't easily mistake it. It's a big thing. I'm told it can actually be seen with binoculars, though so I've never been able to do so myself. Now, Titan was discovered way back in 1655 by Christian Huygens, the Dutch astronomer who was probably the best observer of the time. And of course, it was imaged by the Voyagers. And there's a Voyager image showing very little. But I'll come to that later. We should logically deal with Titan first, but Titan is so important, I think we leave it to last and concentrate now on the smaller and medium-sized satellites. Now, the Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schicchini, was called to Paris, and in 1671, he discovered the second satellite of Saturn, the one we now call Aepetus. And it's a fairly easy object, usually. But Cassini found something else very strange. He worked out that Aepetus goes around Saturn in 79 days, and it's more than two million miles away from the planet. But it is variable. When west of Saturn, it's quite conspicuous, above magnitude 10. When east, it dims down. And Cassini originally thought it disappeared completely for a few weeks, each revolution. Well, it doesn't do that, but certainly, when east of Saturn, it does dim down by well over the magnitude and becomes quite a difficult object. And that baffled Cassini, but finally, he found out why. And we now know the answer. Aepetus has two unequal hemispheres. One is as bright as snow, and the other is blacker than a blackboard. And that is shown here in these Voyager pictures. Now, there's a Voyager picture of Aepetus. You might imagine the sunlight's coming down from top left. It's not. It's coming from bottom right. And that dark area really is dark. And here's a more detailed picture. You can see the dark areas and the bright areas are equally cratered. The only difference is in sheer darkness. And we have here what I call the zebra problem. Is a zebra a black animal with white stripes or a white animal with black stripes? And in the case of Aepetus, we can find out. By the way in which it moves, we can find out how massive it is. Knowing how massive it is, we can find out its density. And it turns out to be not a great deal denser than water, so ice is a very important constituent. So it really is a bright globe with a dark stain. And what exactly is that dark stain? Well, it's very curious. Uh, one idea was it might be due to material wafted onto Aepetus from the outer satellite, Phoebe, which does have a darky surface. Material sputtered from there might, it was said, land on Aepetus and darken it. But I think there are two arguments against that. First of all, the color of Aepetus is not the same as the color of Phoebe. And secondly, even on the bright part of Aepetus, there are created the dark floors. So I think almost certainly the dark material has welled up from inside the satellite and come to the crust. Just exactly what that material is, frankly, we don't know. And neither do we know why only Aepetus has this curious characteristic. But what about the variations? Well, Aepetus, as I say, goes around Saturn in 79 days. It spins on its axis in exactly the same time captured or synchronous rotation, and therefore keep the same face of Saturn all the time, just as the Moon does with the Earth. And there's no mystery about that. Tidal friction over the ages is responsible, and most satellites do the same thing. And therefore, every time Aepetus is west of Saturn, its bright side is turned towards us, and it's east, we see its dark side. Therefore, if you want to see it, the best time to look is near western elongation, and that will happen at the end of January, on January the 31st, and there we have the position, of course, in that picture, we made Aepetus far brighter than it really is, actually looks like a faint star. So Aepetus is a curious thing, and certainly a most mysterious world. Well, Cassini went on. In the following year, 1672, he discovered another satellite, this one we call Rhea. Close went to Saturn, just about the same size as Aepetus, but a different kind of world. It didn't vary, and the surface is definitely heavily cratered a rather battered kind of world. And there, again, is a Voyager picture, and more detailed views show craters all over the place. A very battered world indeed. And then Cassini was, didn't give up. He went on observing, and years later, he found two more satellites, Tethys and Dione. Now, this is a drawing I made a little while ago. 
uh, the rings are Saturn there, and below the ring on the left-hand side, you can see two specks, and they are Tethys and Dione. And uh, of course, they're also captured by Voyager 1, and there's the close-range picture of those two moons. Much smaller than Apetus, again, icy and cratered, and they are not alike. Here's a picture of Tethys, and that's a globe of almost pure ice. There are craters there, and a huge trench that goes almost all the way around the satellite. And the rest of the surface is conventionally cratered. Dione, just about the same size as Tethys, is rather different. It's much more massive, and there are craters there you can see. And a lava lovely picture of Dione is seen silhouetted against Saturn. And also we can see Dione's shadow actually on the disk. I may say, these shadow trances of Saturn satellites are difficult to observe, apart from Titans, not near so big as they are in the case of Jupiter's. Now, the remaining satellites are much smaller. In 1787, the great William Herschel discovered two more, Mimus and Enceladus, much closer into Saturn. And they are strange worlds. Look at this one, a Voyager picture showing Mimus. And Mimus only 260 miles across. And look at that one huge crater there, now named in honor of Herschel. And you know, if that crater were formed by an impacting body, I think mine must have been in very grave danger of being smashed up. And there are plenty of craters over the rest of the surface as well. But Enceladus is quite different. And there are areas on Enceladus where there are no craters at all. And the whole surface gives the impression of being young. What craters there are, are very much smaller. And what about those crater-free areas, as shown there? By the way, those black specks are instrumental defects. So what's happened? Were the areas ever cratered? And if so, what's gone wrong? It may well be that there were craters there, and they've been destroyed by material, soft material, welling up from inside the satellite. And that will make Enceladus an active body. It is only just over 300 miles in diameter. Certainly you can't have water there, and certainly no atmosphere either. So it's a very strange thing. And Enceladus really is rather a problem. It may well be the inside is being flexed by the gravitational pulls of Saturn and the other satellites and warmed up, and we don't know. Certainly, Enceladus is a strange thing. No other satellites were found for some time, but then, in 1848, Bond in America and Lassler in England discovered a new one called Hyperion, much further away from Saturn, much further out than Titan. And Hyperion is faint. I find it a difficult object with my telescope, and it's not spherical. Voyager shows it shaped rather like a hamburger. Look at that picture, another view there. And another curious thing about it, as I said just now, most satellites have their spins equated with their periods of revolution, so they keep the same faces turned toward their primaries. Hyperion, it doesn't. It goes around Saturn in just over 21 days, but its rotation is not synchronous. It tumbles along, and the rotation period isn't even constant. And also, you know, looking at Hyperion, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that it is a part of a larger object that broke up. But if that is so, then where's the other part? Certainly Hyperion appeared to be darker than the other icy satellites. In 1904, the American astronomer, W. H. Pickering, believed he'd found another satellite orbiting between the orbits of Titan and Hyperion, and even given a name, Themis. But Themis was never seen again and I don't think now there's any doubt that what Dick Pickering did was mistake a faint star for a satellite. But mind you, Pickering had already found one Saturnian moon way back in 1898 photographically. And this is called Phoebe. And Phoebe is of course different from all the others. It's small, and it was not well imaged by Voyager. It goes around Saturn at more than 8 million miles. And unfortunately, when the Voyager went by, Phoebe was nowhere near. And that is the only reasonable picture we have of it, showing a few light and dark areas. And the surface does appear to be generally rather darkish. But the movement also is strange. It goes around Saturn the wrong way, like a car going the wrong way around a roundabout. All the other satellites go around in the same sense, but Phoebe doesn't. It goes around in a retrograde way. Therefore, I don't think there's the slightest doubt that Phoebe is not a genuine satellite at all, but merely an asteroidal body captured by Saturn in the remote past and couldn't get away again. So Phoebe, I'm sure, is not a genuine member of the Saturnian system. Now, finally, let's come to the giant, giant Titan. And Titan is easy to see, and you can even see its shadow on the planet is in that Paul Dirty drawing. The black speck there on Saturn over the left-hand side is the shadow of Titan. Obviously, 
title was imaged by the Voyager probes, and there's a Voyager picture showing very little, because Titan, alone among planetary satellites, is surrounded by a dense atmosphere, and Voyager couldn't see through it. In fact, some details have been recorded by the Hubble Space Telescope, but we're not quite sure yet what they are. Back to Voyager, there's haze above Titan's limb, and at one stage, Titan was seen as a crescent, a view, of course, you can't have from Earth. But what exactly is this atmosphere? Well, rather surprisingly, we found out that Titan's atmosphere is mainly nitrogen, which, of course, makes up 78% of the air that you and I are breathing. Therefore, if there's a dense nitrogen atmosphere, then why can't there be life? I think two reasons. First of all, in Titan's atmosphere, what is not nitrogen is mainly methane or marsh gas, uh, and you can't breathe that. And secondly, the question of temperature. Titan is very cold, so methane can exist either solid, liquid, or gas. And on Titan, may have cliffs of solid methane, oceans or rivers of liquid methane, and a methane rain dripping down all the time from the orange clouds in the nitrogen sky. And I wonder, will Titan be anything like those poor dirty drawings? I think we should find out in the year 2004, because at this moment, a probe is on its way there, the Cassini probe carrying a lander named in honor of Christian Huygens. They should get there in the year 2004 and then drop Huygens down onto Titan's surface. And what it'll find there, we don't know. It may come down on solid ground, they come among ice, or it may splash down in a chemical ocean. I don't know, we won't find out for some time yet, but within that at all, we'll be able to tell you in the Sky at Night program for November 2004. Meanwhile, do go and have a look at Titan. Any telescope will show it, and I believe it can even be seen with binoculars, although I have got myself. Voyager discovered some extra satellites, all close into Saturn, all very much smaller, and not seen from here. But altogether, Saturn's family uh, is quite extensive. So let's have one more look at what we might see if we are in a rocket passing Saturn and Daini. We might have that kind of view. But of course, you can, with a telescope, see the satellites yourselves. And uh, if you go out and turn your telescope towards Saturn, then you should see several. Titan, certainly, Iapetus when well-placed, Tethys and Dione, and Rhea, or remotely, the others are more difficult. But Saturn's family is extensive. There are 18 known satellites. There may be other smaller ones, and Saturn's family is more extensive than any other member of the solar system. Don't forget, if you want the latest information, then dial up our information line, 0891-800-330. And if you want your newsletter, then send your stamped address envelope to News Number 68, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W1270S, or you can dial up CFAX, page 620. When I come back next month, I'm going to be joined by David Malin, the great Australian astronomical photographer, and I'm going to show you some of his latest magnificent pictures. So until then, I must say, since this is our first program of 1998, I hope it's not too late to wish you all a very Happy New Year. Good night.